Hello, and welcome to the Grove Church Podcast. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor there, and we are so glad that you're joining us. Whether you are a member and you're just catching up on a sermon that you missed, or you're someone who's brand new, we are really glad that you are joining us. And if you are new in some way, and I know that a lot of people will do that, will listen to sermons first before they visit, I want you to know that we would love to meet you at any point. You can join us live in our services on Sunday, 9 and 1030, or our streaming service at 1030. Either way, we would love to be able to get to know you. And regardless of why you are here uh, listening to this sermon today, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Well, hey, good morning. I'm Mark, executive pastor here. I want to welcome you. Uh, and as you see, we got this, this series we're finishing up today talking about these different miracles of Jesus. Uh, but before I do that, I want to make a, a one more uh, shameless uh, plea that if you are a part of the community uh, at the Grove and uh, you want to be connected, that we've got this directory that we're trying to bring together. So uh, we've got pictures going on out there and I'd encourage you to, to just step out there real quick and get your picture taken so that we can get faces with names. And it really is, if you haven't heard me already make my spill about this, it really is that simple and really, really huge that we're just able to know, hey, these are the people that are part of the community. Uh, when I say somebody's name, that we can actually go and look and, uh, and on a Sunday morning go, oh, okay, so that's what they look like. I can see them across the room. And uh, it might not feel like a big deal, but it really is. We did get a, a couple of questions about security with that. What the, what's that going to look like? And we're using this service that's going to make it very secure. Basically, if you're a part of the community, then you also get to see the other people that are in the community. But you have to verify that by an email that's actually in that system. And uh, there's also some things that we can do with this service where you can personalize it and, and allow some things to be seen and other things not to be seen. We'll do a tutorial on that once we get all the pictures together. But... Anyway, I just encourage you to, to join in and take what may feel like a baby step, but is a huge step in us being a community. You know, I was just talking to somebody this morning that uh, it's the first time to, to come to the Grove. And I said, man, really, for me, I've just started to realize that this is what church is about. Like, there's the, there's the music and us worshiping together, and there's the teaching from God's Word, but... Man, it's just it's these people, <laughs> these, these people, you know, this is who we come. Now, you, you need to hear from me, and I need to hear from you, and, and we need to, to know one another. And so we're really trying to do that. So, okay, I'll stop there. I can keep going. Um, hey, I get the privilege of getting to be the one that talks about the post-resurrection miracles of Jesus. And there's quite a few of them, um, and so I can't really walk through all of them this morning, and so... I did take the time to look at him and to think, man, which one of these is the most miraculous to me? Uh, also, I, when Charlie and I were looking at all the different uh, parts of the series, I picked it out immediately, honestly, because one of those miracles is Jesus making breakfast. And I just, you know, I just appreciate that. And I'm like, you know, if, if, if Jesus says, come and have breakfast with me, then that's, that's one of breakfast being my favorite meal. Uh, I'm like, if Jesus says, let's have breakfast, then I want to talk about that. What was in that? And we're going to get to that in a second because it's the, the very last chapter of the book of John. And there's way more there than just breakfast. Uh, when I really got into it, I never really studied it this intensely before. Um, but I kind of in the same sense, in, in, in John, the end of John, we're going to look at this person, Peter, and what Jesus does there in, in chapter 21. Uh, but kind of just this bigger picture, I want to invite you to think about this. So we have seen Jesus, you know, healing and, and doing all these, these miraculous things, calming the wind and the waves. Um, Post-resurrection, uh, Matthew 28 he tells, you know, his, his followers to meet him on this hill, and he, and he meets them there. And then what does he say, say to them, what we call the Great Commission? He says, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all the things I've commanded you. And behold, I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. And it says that on that hill that, that some worshipped, but also some doubted. And uh, when you start reading at the end of each one of the Gospels, you definitely see, I mean, this group of folks who, like, they're, they're 
committed, but you know, there, there's enough there that you can tell that it's like, is this really the group that we want to hand this huge thing to? This is the group that is going to go forth and make sure that this good news makes it to, to all nations? This is the group, you know? Uh, Peter in particular, you know, he just denied Jesus three times. That's the guy? And, and that Jesus would make that plan A with, with no plan B? Y'all, I, I mean, there's some miraculous things we've talked about, but that, that's pretty miraculous. That Jesus would commission them, give them that task, and trust it to them, and empower them to do it, so much so that we look around this room today, and we know about this good news because it was passed to us because people actually were faithful with it. That's amazing. And also, just big picture, as we talk about Peter today, I want to make sure that, that we make it really personal. Because when Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and he says, teach them to obey the things I've commanded you, that's been passed to us as well. The commands and what it looks like to obey them and one command in particular is the one I just gave you. <laughs> Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So you, too, get to be a part of this amazing miracle that Jesus does post-resurrection and what he calls us to. Um, but like I said, I want to look specifically today at how this works out with Peter. Because, you know, we, again, we've seen Jesus heal, physical healing. We've seen him do these things. But what we see here is Jesus does this restoration of Peter in his heart. Um, he calls him back to, to follow him and to be a part of this, this kingdom work. And, um, and it's a restoration. The, the truth is you would miss it. You would, you would wonder uh, why these loose ends aren't tied up with Peter if we didn't have chapter 21 of the book of John. Because here he is. He's just denied Jesus three times. And then you flip over, and now we're in Acts, and Peter is, is the man, you know? He's bold. He's being used of God. He, he, didn't look, he doesn't look anymore like the guy who denied Jesus three times. So, so what happened? How did, how, did, how did all that go down? And uh, I really think it's interesting because in John chapter 20, it, it finishes out like this. Um, and really, this feels like the end of the book. You, you, you just read it with me and see if you don't think the same thing. So now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Now, doesn't that feel like just a good close to the book? In fact, this idea of believing in Jesus Christ is repeated a hundred times in the book of John. And so it really does kind of feel like the exclamation point on the end of the book. And it feels like it should just be over. You know, this is where you stop. And then the next verse, he says, and then after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples. So, uh, so John chapter 21 feels like what? Now, growing up, going to movies, maybe this happened. Uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember waiting around for the credits to finish for that extra scene. I mean, when the credits started to roll, we would just get up and leave the movie theater. The movie's over, right? And, uh, and I remember the first time my boys were like, no, no, Dad, we can't leave. I'm like, why can't we leave? The movie's over. No, the movie's not over. There's this extra scene that's going to come up, and it's going to give you some insight to about, about what's fixing to happen or close up some loose ends to the story. And that's exactly what chapter 21 feels like. It feels like the book finished. Well, ho, 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 but there's one more thing we've got to find out. What's, what's going on with this Peter so that when we get to Acts, we can, we can put all the pieces together? Um, and so here we go. Chapter 21, verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And when he revealed himself, and he revealed himself in this way, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana uh, in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others, uh, and two others of the disciples were there together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. 
And they went out and they got into a boat, but all night long they fished and caught nothing. All right, so there's a lot of debate here about what's going on. I mean, is, is Peter just in all-out disobedience? You know, he's, he's supposed to be waiting, and Jesus is revealing these things to them. And for him to say, hey, I'm, I'm just going to go fishing. You know, if I just say I'm going to go fishing, I'm not a fisherman. That means absolutely nothing. It means I'm going to go out and pretend like I'm fishing for a little bit and catch nothing. It would, it would be expected. I also wouldn't last all night if I went fishing. I'd last about 30 minutes and I'd get bored. Um, so, but for Peter to say, hey, I have decided that I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm tired of waiting uh, he's, of course, the one that's, that's impatient. I resonate most with, with Peter. Do you remember? He's the guy that um, when everybody's afraid, he's the first one that steps out and says and makes the confession that Jesus is the Christ. He's the one when Jesus comes walking out on water, he's the one that dives out of the boat and goes walking out on the water to him. As long as he looks at Jesus, he stays afloat. He's the one when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. He's the one that goes, no, 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 you can't, you can't wash my feet. And uh, he says, no, I, I don't really got to wash your feet. And he's like, well, if you're going to wash my feet, then wash, you know, my head and my hands. And he's like, you don't need a bath, Peter. I, I just need to wash your feet. He, he's that guy. And I really resonate with him. He's a, he's a uh, you know, fire ready aim kind of guy. Like he's already, he's already out of the boat before he even asked the questions. He's the one, one of my favorites, strangely enough. He's one of the ones, that he, he's the one in the garden that when the, the servant of the high priest comes up, he, he cuts off his ear. Remember that? He's the one that promises, no, I will not deny you. And Jesus says, yes, you, you will. You'll deny me three times. And sure enough, he's the one that, that denied him. And so you've got this picture of, of Peter, and now all of that has happened. And he said, you know what? I'm going to go fishing. Which some wonder if that's not just a, re a return, almost like these three years with Jesus. And it's like, well, that was fun. But now I'm going to go back to doing the thing that I, that I do. And I fish. Real quick, I just want to remind you. That, so in Luke chapter 5 is the, probably the best picture of this of Peter's original calling. Uh, he's been fishing again all night, having caught nothing. He's there in his boat, uh, washing his nets. Jesus is on the shore teaching. Uh, the crowd starts to press in on Jesus. So Jesus gets into Peter's boat. He, he teaches from the boat. And then he says, hey, uh, why don't we go out and drop your nets? And Peter's like, Hey, I know, I know you're good at the thing you do, Jesus, but I'm the fisherman, and we fished all night, and we didn't catch anything, but if you say so, we'll go do it. And they go out, and they catch so many fish that the boats start to sink. When this happens, it says in uh, Luke chapter 5 that Peter fell down at Jesus' knees and started saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Uh, for he and all who were with them were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And then Jesus said, do not be afraid. From now on, Peter, you're going to be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. So that's what had happened. Peter had seen that this, this Jesus was the real deal. And he immediately confessed. He left his nets and he, he followed and now he's been called to this huge thing. He's not, just, he's not catching fish. Now he's going to be a part of this kingdom work of catching men. And so then he's been with Jesus through all of this, but we find him here back fishing again. And um, it goes on to say that just as day was breaking, verse 4 of John chapter 21, Jesus stood on shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you not have any fish? So one thing I just think is interesting, you know, Jesus, let's say that, uh, I mean, it, it, whether they're disobedient or not, at least they're disillusioned, right? And trying to figure out what's going on. And Jesus goes to them where they are. He's on the shore. And he says, children, do you, do you not have any fish? Hey, you fishermen, do you not have any? Have you ever been fishing and somebody asks you, if you when you haven't caught anything and somebody asks you if you caught anything and how demoralizing it is to say, no, I, nope, I got, I got none. 
They answered and said, no. And he said to them, well, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul in uh, the quantity of fish that they caught. Now, look, I, this is one of those things that if you just stop and think about it a little bit. All right. So you take the nets out of this side of the boat and you and then you move them over and you put them in that side of the boat. That's not very far, right? <laughs> It's not like they went to a different part of the lake and he had some secret fishing advice that he was giving them. I mean, the truth is, by the time they picked the nets up and moved them over, the boat probably floated a little bit and they put it right back down in the exact same spot. The point was, you guys did it your way. Now, do it my way. Put it on the other side of the boat and see what happens. And Jesus shows his power because they, they catch all these fish. He even gives us the number here in a minute, 153 of them. He didn't come yelling and screaming at them. He met them where they were, and, and they saw that it was Jesus. So the, the disciple, I love this, all the way through the book of John, this is what John says. The, the disciple who Jesus loved, he describes himself that way. Instead of just saying, you know, at first he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm the one that, that Jesus loved. I think that's kind of snarky on John's part. I don't really like it much. But anyway, the one that uh, Jesus loved said to Peter, oh, it's the Lord. And so it says, when Peter heard this, that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Now, this is the cultural piece that confuses me, and I really don't have an answer to it, and I wish I could, you know, I really understood that he's about to jump into the water, and so he puts on more clothes. Uh, I would think that you would strip something off, not put something on, but it, it is what it is. He, he was stripped for work. He put on his outer garment, and then he describes it this way. He, he threw himself into the sea. I mean, is anybody else immediately thinking about Forrest Gump? You know that scene where he's in a shrimp boat and he sees his buddy up on the dock and he just throws himself into the sea? Every time I've ever seen Forrest Gump, and I've seen that part, and then the boat just goes on and runs into things because it doesn't have anybody driving it because he, he was so excited about seeing his buddy that he just threw himself into the sea. Even the way that that's worded, he just he flung himself. It was ridiculous. It was a crazy move. And it's also crazy because here he is, he's been fishing. He gets the thing that all night long they've been trying so hard to get. He gets the fish. But immediately he realizes that the fish, that's not the point. Jesus is on the shore. And so all I care about right now is how quickly can I get from here to there? It says the rest of the guys, they bring the fish in. They were about 100 yards off and they bring the fish in. But he fling, flung himself into the sea. And does the ridiculous thing. Have you ever felt like that about your relationship with Jesus and just done something ridiculous or reckless? It just didn't make sense. You know, one thing I've seen is that, that love, real love, causes us to do crazy things, right? I mean, it does, you know... Um, man and woman, when you really love a girl, dudes will do some crazy stuff, you know? When you really parent the child, when you really love your kids, I mean, I've done things as a dad that I never would have expected that I would do because I'm in love, you know? And the same is true when you really, really fall in love with Jesus. Sometimes you just do some ridiculous things, you know? You're not afraid to look like a fool, I was thinking back, um, something that still astounds me that I did. Um, just, just out of college, uh, I walked from uh, across the ravine in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, uh, to go and help the Henderson State football team with starting some Bible studies and things like that. And if you know anything about what that means, that is basically like flinging yourself into the sea. Um, and what I mean by that is that I, I grew up, I found out that not, maybe not everybody's like this, but rivalries mean something to me. Uh, I love to hate the, the team that we're supposed to hate. I mean, I, I enjoy that. I, I, uh, so like growing up, 
Arkansas fans were supposed to hate Texas, and I was at the front of that. You know, I, my high school football team, we had a town uh, you know, not too far away, and that was our rival, and we, we, we hated them. That's, that's, I mean, that's the kindest word I can say. I mean, I, I grew up in a family that loved Chevys, and you were supposed to hate Fords. I was talking to somebody yesterday about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's deep down inside of me. And when I showed up to Washita Baptist University to play football, at that point, they weren't even playing the game against Henderson because the rivalry had gotten so intense that cheerleaders had been kidnapped, uh, there had been destruction to all kinds of property, and they stopped playing the game. And my first start my sophomore year was the restoration of that game, Washita versus Henderson. And so then fast forward a couple years and I start following Jesus and I see the power that he, that he has and, and these Bible studies and how I can help these guys. And I walked across the ravine to go. And when I found myself in that football dorm at Henderson talking about Jesus, I thought to myself, self, what in the world is wrong with you? <laughs> how did we get here? What about you? Is it... Has there been something crazy, ridiculous, reckless? I mean, I just love that picture of, of Peter. And then it says in verse 9 that he got to, to shore, and there was, a char there was a charcoal fire in place with fish already laid out on it. Jesus already has the fire going. He's already got fish. They're bringing the fish from shore, but he's already got his own fish. He's already cooking. And Jesus said to them, which I think is kind of funny, bring, bring me some of the fish that you caught. Did they really do anything? I mean, really, they picked the nets up, they put it on the other side of the boat. Again, they didn't even move them. Jesus, these are the fish that Jesus caught. But he says, bring me the fish that you caught. So Simon Peter, uh, Peter went aboard and hauled the net to shore full of 153 fish, but the nets were not torn. And Jesus said, and this is a great memory verse if you're looking for one, Jesus said to them, come have breakfast. Yeah, one thing that you got to love about these different accounts of Jesus post-resurrection, I mean, man, food is just a big deal. It's important. And he says to these guys, hey, we're going to come and we're going to have a meal together. I came to the place where you are. You meet me on this shore. And we're going to share a meal. And that, that means something. Jesus met Peter again, the Peter who has denied him three times. He meets him right where he is. And he says, let's have breakfast. Mm, Jesus likes breakfast too. Uh, verse 15. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And there's some debate about this. What, is, what, is, what are the these? Is Jesus looking at him and saying, Peter, do you, do you love me more than these 153 fish? These? Is he saying, um, do you love me more than these, these friends of yours? Do you love them more than me? Or do you love me more than them? Or is he saying, hey, the, you know, the degree to which these guys love me? Do you, is your degree higher? Do you love me more than, than they love me? And then he said to him, uh, Lord, you, you know that I love you. Something that's really interesting about this, this, this love that Jesus says when he says, do you love me more than these? That love is the love that means sacrificial love. It's a term that means you, you, you love me like that. You love me to the, to the way that you would sacrifice for it. So when Peter answers, he says, Lord, you know that I brotherly love you. <laughs> you know, so Jesus says, Are you, do, you, do you love me sacrificially? And Peter says, you know that I love you like a brother, Jesus. And so um, Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And then Jesus said it a second time, Simon, son of John, do you sacrificially love me? And Peter says back, Lord, you know that I love you like a brother. Jesus says, tend my sheep, calling him back to that original call to follow me and be a fisher of men. And so then Jesus says it a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But this time he doesn't use the sacrificial. 
he uses the brotherly love. He uses the term that Peter's been using. He says a third time, Peter, do you love me like a brother? And uh, Peter was grieved because he had to say it the third time. And also, given what I just told you about the different loves that have been used, that Jesus reverted back, <laughs> not the sacrificial love. Now he's met him at that level. Do you, do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, you, you know that I love you like a brother. You know everything that, that, uh, that I, you know that I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. He says it, he says it three times. Uh, in the same way that Peter denied him three, three times. And then look what he does in verse 18. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and, and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. That's a picture of sacrificial love. So Jesus meets him where he is, but then he promises him that this sacrificial love, that kind of relationship with Jesus, is in Peter's future. That kind of love. I think it's interesting that he specifically says, you're going to do the thing that you don't want to do. Because all of us, you know, I mean, having breakfast with Jesus on the beach, yeah, man. Let's say, I bet that was some really good fish, you know? I don't know what seasoning he used, but I mean, Jesus making breakfast, got to be some good breakfast, right? This supernatural catch. And that's great. That's something I want to do. Jesus is calling him to this sacrificial love, to this, this thing, to do the thing that maybe he, he doesn't want to do. And the, the thing is, this in, in the intimate relationship with Jesus happens in those places. And the things that you that you don't want to do beyond the realm of the comfortable, over there in the realm of the uncomfortable for, the, for, for his, his name's sake in the kingdom. I mean, think about it this morning, y'all. I mean, you, you walked in and, and those kids are out there throwing water around and there are adults out there, you know, getting soaked too, standing out there in the sun. And I guarantee you, there's probably somebody out there that wanted to do that. But there were a lot of adults this morning that showed up to go help those kids have a water day that didn't want to do it. And there's something really sweet about that. You know, there's a lot of folks this morning that showed up just using Sunday morning as an example that are doing the thing maybe they didn't want to do. There's something really sweet and powerful about that, that ridiculous thing for Jesus that you wouldn't just do the comfortable but you would go to the realm of the uncomfortable. And in this idea of Jesus saying, hey, you guys go there for and make disciples of all nations. In that task that we have been given, there's a lot of steps that we take that are in the realm of the, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to that place. I don't want to do that thing. I want to, using Sunday morning as an example, I don't, I don't want to come to this place and, and meet the person that I don't know and find the person in the room that may be hurting and try to love on them a bit. I just want to come in and sit and listen and roll and leave. That's the easy place. That's the comfortable place. But on that next step, that beyond that, is this sweet relationship with Jesus that he's saying, and he says to him, just come follow me. Jesus repeats this to Peter here in the same way that he said it back in Luke chapter five, that first meeting, come follow me. I'm calling you to something bigger. He says it to him again. Hey, tell you what, you come follow me. And you know what Peter does? What I would do, what you would do. He looks over at John and he says, what about this bozo? You're calling me to do this thing I don't want to do. What about him? Isn't that what we immediately do? We're like, oh, man, the, the hard thing. Which y'all, but I mean, this room looks very different. I mean, I, I am amazed that in the body of Christ, God has gifted each of us so uniquely and so differently. And he has a place for you. And, you, and a thing that you can do that I can't do. And a thing that I can do that, that, that you can't do. And he's calling you to that thing. And then he calls you to that thing. And, and it's maybe beyond the realm of what's comfortable and easy. And you start to go there. And then you look over at the person next to you. But what about him? What about her? She doesn't have to do anything. And Jesus says the same thing to us that he says to Peter. I mean, you don't worry about him. I got him. 
You're missing the point. It's not about him. It's about, it's about this. You, Peter, follow me. Be a fisher of men. Feed my sheep. Something really special there that we, we don't want to miss. I, uh, there's really only a few... My memory is not that great. And there's really only a few sermons, <laughs> as many, you know, different times that I've heard uh, somebody preach God's word in my life. You would think I would remember more, but there's just a few that really, really stick out. And uh, one of them, you're going to think this is strange, but this, this speaker, he, it was, he was teaching, and then all of a sudden he started talking about his blue jeans. And I think the reason it really stuck out because it made me mad at first. I'm like, why are you talking about your blue jeans? I don't care about your blue jeans. And he kept on going on and on and on about these blue jeans. And he was, he was showing us the way that, like, the knees were worn from working in them. And there were some tears and things and some stains. And, and I'm like, yeah, you got dirty blue jeans on. <laughs> why, why did you wear them today? I don't get it. <laughs> Change the subject, man. And then he started talking about, you know, when he went to his closet that, there were the nice, pressed, clean, brand new blue jeans that hung in there that he'd really only worn once or twice. But whenever he went to his closet, he immediately was drawn to those jeans. You know that one pair of jeans that when you put them on, they just, they just fit you right because you've worn them so much. They're worn to all of your, you know, parts and they just fit you just right. And you do remember that stain and how you got it that there and, and why that knee is messed up. And, and I was still confused for a while. And then finally he brought it together. He's like, man, the people who get to experience that, that deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. They're the ones that are available. And they're the ones that, you know, in the hard place where the knee gets torn, in the place where the stain happens, in, in this, you know, mistakes and being restored because Jesus restores us and, and uses us, the, the one who's available and obedient and, and there to go to that next place, not just the comfortable closet, but the hard place, those are the ones. Those are the ones that get to experience that, that close relationship with Jesus. And I think that's true. You know, I think he's calling us. You, I think he's calling the grove. Past breakfast. You know, to that next thing. That place that maybe is a little bit less comfortable but a little bit more intimate with him. Thanks again for joining us on our sermon podcast. And you can learn more about us at thegrovechurch.org. And if you go to thegrovechurch.org slash connect, there's a form you could fill out. Just let us know that you've been listening. And if you want to dig deeper on some of these topics that we cover in our sermon podcast or just in other issues of dealing with culture or theology, those kinds of things, uh, you can check out our Cultivate podcast, which is on the same feed, um, however you found this particular podcast. So again, this is Charlie, the lead pastor at The Grove, and thank you so much for joining us.